Hello and welcome to a new episode of the All Plane Podcast, where every week we talk about some interesting aspect of the aviation industry in the company of expert professionals. But first of all, allow me a quick reminder that you can find all episodes of this podcast, as well as many other interesting stories about commercial aviation, on our website, allplane.tv. A double L E L A N E dot T V. Check it out. If we look beyond the current pandemic crisis, it appears that decarbonization and sustainability are among the biggest challenges, perhaps even the most important challenge that the airline industry faces. We have covered green flying technologies in one of the very first podcasts I recorded. Back then, Swedish engineer Bjorn Ferm explained to me the principles of hydrogen power flight and the challenges to make it a reality. So I got curious about this very promising technology and started doing some research. To my surprise, a stream of news about hydrogen and aviation started flowing in. For example, Airbus just presented its three eye-catching hydrogen power aircraft concepts. On that very same week, Zero Avia a startup that is working on a hydrogen powertrain for aircraft made also headlines when it completed a demonstration flight. So I wanted to learn more about this promising technology and I invited Zero Avia's chief financial officer, Katya Akulinicheva, to join us here on the podcast in order to learn more about this project and how it aims to transform aviation for the better. But perhaps best of all is that we hear it directly from her. Without further ado, let me welcome Katya to the podcast. Hello, Katia. How are you? Hi, Mikael. Very well, thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, you represent today Zero Avia, that is one of the companies that is making the headlines in the field of green flying and green aviation. Because, well, you are going to explain to us now, but basically, you are working on a very interesting project in the field of uh, hydrogen propulsion, mm-hmm. and I think it's very interesting. We we have you here today, but first of all. Let's start by the very beginning. Can you explain us what's your role at Zero Avia and also a little bit about the background of the company and who you guys are and how this whole story started? Absolutely. Yeah. And I'll give you also a bit of my personal background just so you know kind of my reference point to all of this and sort of how I, you know, how I came to be part of the team. Um, so I've been with Zero Avia for a year and a half. Uh, I'm based in London. Um, so we have, we're located between the US and the UK and I'm part of the UK team. And my role at Zero Avia is CFO. So I look after all things, finance, operations, fundraising, um, and I guess anything to do with kind of financial numbers when it comes to business and things like that. Um, so over the, la- the course of the last six months, I've been mainly working on our Series A fundraise, which we uh, hope to be announcing in the next month or so, um, as well as supporting the team on a number of other initiatives. Um, and my personal background is on the investor side. So I used to work in uh, venture capital for a few years and prior to that private equity. Um, so I actually met Val, uh, our, our, our CEO and founder, Val Miftikov. I met him in the context of his previous business, which was an electric vehicle charging company. Uh, he was raising the Series A for that about four years ago. Um, and he came to the fund that I was running at the time called Systemic. Uh, we started looking at the company, but unfortunately he ended up selling it before we got a chance to invest. Um, so we didn't work together then. Uh, but about six months later, he came back to Systemic uh, with this new idea uh, to basically say, you know what? I I think I kind of know what's happening on the ground now. I think we're on the right track, but in the air, you know, we have a really big problem. It's really hard to decarbonize aviation. um, And most of the solutions that are out there today just don't match the timeframes that we need. Um, And so Systemic um, and Zeravia started a partnership quite early on in the company's history, uh, where initially it was more of an advisory partnership. And so Systemic helped uh, Zeravia on its kind of go-to-market strategy and its product roadmap and things like that. So really thinking through how do you start and where do you go from there? Um, and then Systemic also invested in Zero Avia back in 2019 while I was still there. Um, and after completing the investment, I decided to, to move across because I'd never actually worked inside a startup before. And for many reasons, Zero Avia was just the perfect fit. Um, so that's kind of how I've how I arrived there. So I've known the team for a while, but initially in an investor capacity, technically. So that's a bit of just how I got here. Um, and a bit more about Zero Avia. So as I mentioned, it was started by Val right after selling his previous business. Um, so he exited it to NL, the Italian utility was quite a successful story and that company is now doing very, very well. Um, and so Val was after the next challenge, uh, which as I said, was sort of aviation. And I think it's important to note that 
as a company, we did not start off being a hydrogen fuel cell company. We started off saying, thinking, we really want to fix this problem in the sector. How can we do it? And how can we do it in the most capital efficient and therefore time efficient manner so that these solutions are actually available to be flown by people in some sort of meaningful time frame? And so very early on in the company's history, we did a scan of kind of what we think is out there, you know, from sustainable aviation fuels to battery to hybrid uh, to alternative modes of transport altogether. And we concluded actually that hydrogen had been a largely overlooked solution in aviation and has the largest potential to decarbonize the sector at scale. Certainly once you look at sort of larger airframes, longer missions, uh, you, you just can't quite get the numbers to work with any other solution. Mm -hmm. So early on, we made a few design choices that still guide how we were operate as a company. One of them is that we, so we focus on hydrogen electric. Um, so it's, I guess hydrogen is the first part of that. So we, we just think from a first principle standpoint, hydrogen has superior energy density um, and we will struggle to solve this problem without it. Hydrogen electric, because we think that hydrogen combustion while better than jet, uh, doesn't benefit from all the um, efficiency improvements of an electric system, and it still is a combustion engine, so it still has uh, various kind of uh, byproducts. Um, the other design choice we made early on is to focus on the powertrain. So we don't design the whole airframe, we design just the powertrain system, uh, at least in this early stage when we're focusing on the airframe sizes that we are. And the reason we did that is that we thought that that's actually really where the bottleneck is and that for aircraft, you know, kind of five to 20 seat category, we largely can work with them as they are today and just swap the engines that they come with for a hydrogen system. So we don't actually need to make significant modifications to the airframe at this point. Over time, as we scale to large airframes and longer missions, there will need to be design changes that need to be made, but we would rather do them together with the airframe manufacturers rather than kind of become an Airbus ourselves. Um, and the final kind of bit that I've alluded to already is our initial focus is um, on the sort of five to 20 seat passenger category. So our kind of real commercial introduction will be targeting uh, planes of up to 19 passengers flying 500 nautical miles. So that gives you sort of a bit of an idea of like the things that we really locked in from early on because of our desire to sort of solve this problem in a technically and economically viable way to solve it soon and, and to be able to actually have real traction that we can point to, to move the industry along. Mm -hmm. And I would say that's, that's, you know, that's been a really guiding factor about how we operate over the last few years. Very interesting. And um, your main operation base is in California? Uh, yeah. So our headquarters is in the U.S. Uh, so uh -huh. California is, is our primary location. Um, and, you know, until a year and a half ago, when I joined the company, we, California is our only location. Uh, but in the last year and a half, we have actually grown very significantly in the U.K., Mm -hmm. um, that's been driven by a couple of factors. Probably the biggest one is um, the fact that we've been getting very helpful support from the UK government uh, through Innovate UK, which is the grant um, organization here. Um, so, we, so a lot of our R&D here receives non-dilutive funding support. So that has uh, you know, encouraged us to establish an R&D operation here. But beyond the funding, we have also uh, seen a lot of interest from industry um, across the supply chain, but also from operators in actually accelerating this technology. So both kind of for finance, but also for business reasons, it has made a lot of sense for us to, uh, to build up a big location here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was about to ask because uh, you had a recent flight that was all yeah. over the place in the media. That was your first prototype, right? The, the, the one that flew like one month ago? In yeah, so what we've been doing, I guess, um, since inception, uh, we had the, the version one of our, of our product was actually developed in California in 2019. Mm -hmm. So we started doing some flight testing already um, on a battery only system in California on the aircraft that we have in the US. Uh, and then what we did this year is we got a second air uh, aircraft in the UK uh, as part of the grant project that we're running here. We designed the version two of our prototype, which you know follows a lot of the same principles, but takes into account the learnings that we had from the early flight testing. Um, and we've been flying on that since June. So in June, we had uh, the, a battery only flight that also got quite good coverage and people were very excited to see it coming out of Cranfield. Uh, but then more importantly, in September, we demonstrated a flight using a hydrogen fuel cell system, which was a, you know, it was a very, very big moment for us um, and for the industry in general. Um, mm -hmm. And indeed, you know, things have really picked up uh, since that, that happened. And it, it so happened to be the same week that Airbus also made their announcement about um, their endorsement of hydrogen technology. So it was, you know, it was a good week for hydrogen yeah. aviation. 
Yeah. Indeed, it, it looks like hydrogen the last six months has picked up a lot of speed with all these different projects. I have to admit, it was not very much in my in my radar, but I had a, one of the very first podcasts that, that I did here on this series was with a um, Swedish engineer called Bjorn Firm. He has a very interesting series of articles about different alternative propulsion mm -hmm. systems. And he's the one that told me, yeah, you know, hydrogen is actually a very interesting technology. And we discussed that because he was a bit skeptical about the possibility of scaling up batteries with current technology. So he told me, well, you know, there's this hydrogen thing. So that's yeah. why I started looking into this matter. And Well, I heard a little bit before that, but it, it was not really one of the areas I was most yeah. looking into. And now the last six months, it's been news nonstop about different uh, yeah. approaches. And we had, of course, this Airbus announcement recently. So, yeah, it looks like it's picking up speed. What are you guys planning to do next? I mean, you have now, you're at a stage where you said you are about to close a Series A funding. Mm -hmm. yeah. you, I guess you are now privately financed. So to date, we received about uh, probably seven and a half million dollars of funding in total. Okay. Um, of which probably f sort of five to six has has come from private sources. Um, mm -hmm. So, well, Val himself, our founder, as well as Systemic, where I used to work, mm -hmm. and a number of other angel investors. And then we've received, I guess, something like one and a half million dollars to date in grant funding from the UK in, uh, through the project that we've been running here so far. Mm -hmm. um, and so going forward, we will continue on a similar funding trajectory where we'll, we'll, we'll close a private Series A round, uh, hopefully very soon, um, and then we, in December, are kicking off the next phase of our um, grant-funded R&D in the UK, which mm -hmm. will be a much larger project. Unfortunately, we can't give too many details on it right now because it hasn't been announced, but it's sort of, you know, about a 10x size increase on our pre previous project. So we're really excited about that, and it will, you know, really cement our position um, in the UK. Because I guess the sort of business model or, or, or role in the industry you're aiming for, as you mentioned, first would be to retrofit existing aircraft with your yeah, so power the way that we see our, yeah so i think that so our first commercial product is what we call the za 600 so it's a, our system that has 600 100 kilowatt power output um and it will be tar it, it can power an aircraft of up to 20 passengers uh, for ranges of up to 500 nautical miles so what we have today it is kind of a, a prototype really of that so it's a six seat aircraft system we are testing that at the moment the testing program for that will conclude by the end of this year and we will we're not planning to commercialize that prototype because we think that the six seat aircraft market is quite small and we wouldn't make a tangible difference to emissions if we were to take that product all the way through to certification and commercial introduction. So what we're planning to do is, is from December onwards, start working on the ZA600, so that's the 20 seat aircraft system. Um, and that will be a, probably a two year overall effort, uh, funded in part by the UK government, as I mentioned, as well as private sources. And we'll probably aim to have our the, the system flying on hydrogen for the first time in something like, I would say 12 to 15 months, so that during the course of 2022, we will be kind of really scaling up all the flight testing of that. And then we will submit that the system uh, for certification, probably for some combination of FAA, CAA, and EASA. We haven't decided exactly which pathway will definitely go down, but I think at, you know, at least one of them, possibly more, uh, so that we can have a pr product that is commercially flying by sort of late 2023. And it's also worth mentioning that while, you know, for passenger transport, the certification pathway is quite sort of extensive and takes quite a while. Uh, there are some use cases that we've already started discussing where there are no passengers being flown and therefore the certification hurdles are lower. So for example, cargo, agriculture, surveillance, there are a few other kind of use cases for, you know, for planes uh, that we already are considering uh, doing early sort of commercial pilot projects sooner than that timeline that I mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, for the next two years, we're really focused on getting the 19-seater configured, ground tested, air tested, flying on hydrogen, flying in different conditions and different ranges, uh, testing it in different commercial scenarios. So, so with some of these potential customers and then rolling it out at scale after mm -hmm. that. Have you selected an airframe? I think most likely we're going to be working on the Dornier 228. Okay. Not because that's the product that we think has the greatest commercial potential necessarily, but it's just the best airframe system for, for the type of R&D activity that we need to do. Just its shape and its size uh, is quite sort of conducive to the type of testing that we need to, to do. So that will mm -hmm. most likely be the airframe, yeah. And you had this test flight in, it was in Cranfield, uh, which is a, a 
I mean, it's a very well-known aerospace uh, research center in the UK, about one hour north of London, more or less. And I read the next stage of testing is going to be in Scotland. Am, am I right with that? Or? Uh, well, <laughs> weather dependent to an extent. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, so actually, uh, because we, we put our timeline together before COVID, obviously, no, none mm -hmm. of us planned for, for this. So initially, the final flight testing was supposed to take place around now. And Scotland would still be sort of manageable at that time. But at the moment, it, it's looking more like end of November when the flight conditions are really quite challenging. But I mean, the reason uh, Scotland was supposed to be uh, our target geography, there are two reasons, really. One is that we have a partner uh, on our grant project here called EMEC, the European Marine Environment Center. So they are responsible for the provision of green hydrogen. That's their role in our project. And they're based in Scotland, in the, near the Orkney Islands. So, so they, that's a, a big part of the reason we wanted to do it there. But also, um, Scottish sort of island connectivity is an interesting use case for our technology, where there is already aircraft of that sort of size flying those kinds of uh, missions. Um, and so we wanted to demonstrate that our technology can already be used sort of in that environment. Um, so that was the original plan, but I think when we are, when we are a bit closer to the, that flight testing actually taking place, so maybe in a month or so, we'll see what kind of the weather situation is like. And I think we'll definitely do it in Scotland, but maybe we delay that part a little bit and do it somewhere else uh, mm -hmm. in the meantime. So yes. what's the next milestone in technical terms? I mean, with this testing, are you aiming for a specific goal, specific number of miles flown with the system? Or? Yeah. Like so that. it's, it's the, 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 the outstanding uh, milestone for this system is 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 increasing the range. Uh -huh. So so far, I think our, our test flight in September was something like I want to say something like fourteen minutes, or maybe it was like you know, fourteen, sixteen, something, but something on that order of magnitude. Mm -hmm. um, so at the moment, we're already starting to scale that up, you know, to sort of twenty, a bit longer, a bit longer. And so the three hundred nautical mile is what our target is for this flight, which will in be one, closer to about an hour. Yeah, it will be like 45 minutes to an hour. In time. one go. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So yeah. that's why we selected the kind of the, the route in Scotland was supposed to cover that distance. And once we've shown that in this system, we're kind of done with this phase of the program and then we move into the larger system for the mm -hmm. bigger aircraft. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Actually, I had the, you know, on the podcast, I interviewed the uh, two guys that did uh, all electric flight through Germany and Switzerland mm -hmm. last mm -hmm. summer, last September. They had to do 11 stopovers to, wow. to, to yeah. cross Germany. So that gives you an idea of where we are now in terms of, of range in, in, uh, in this field of green aviation. But hopefully this is going to be progressing soon uh, and fast in, in a yeah. way that uh, distances are going to be increasing. For battery and hydrogen, the constraints are a little bit different. Mm -hmm. uh, hydrogen also does have some weight constraints in that you know, we bring hydrogen on board in a tank. So there's, the tank itself has weight. The gas has weight, the system has weight, so we do yeah. need to factor that in. But for hydrogen, actually, volume is the bigger yeah. sort of factor, whereas for battery, it's kind of the other way around. And actually, that's, for us, probably you know, the primary reason that th three years ago when we first set up, we, even though a lot of us came from the battery electric vehicle background, realized that for our aviation, it's just not the right set of, set mm -hmm. of solutions because it, 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 it's not favorable on weight. It, it is quite favorable in volume, but you know, sort of it's the reverse set of parameters. And also importantly, um, you know, whereas for cars, w when you leave the house in the morning, you don't, you need to have dist fully distributed charging infrastructure to adopt the technology. And it takes a long time to put that in place. Uh, whereas with aviation and hydrogen, we think the kind of charging uh, challenge is a bit easier because they're, you know, they're n you're, you know where you're flying. Yes, of course, you need some emergency refueling, etc. But typically, you have a known point and a known time at which you will need to, to refuel. And you can also roll it out gradually in city pairs, such that the infrastructure challenge is not quite as overwhelming as it is for, for cars. So. Yes. Actually, I read an, a very interesting article a few months ago that explained the differences between the car and planes and, and how hydrogen applies to each. And actually, one of the points of the article was that whereas lots of attention was on the hydrogen for cars that hasn't really taken off. Um, no. Yeah. Uh, but, but actually, maybe the right case, use case for hydrogen was, was airplanes, which uh, yeah. it was kind of the opposite. Like everyone was very focused on electric. Uh, which still might have some uses. I'm not saying electric is out of the question. I mean, and obviously batteries are going to be improving as yeah. well with time. Yeah. But but it seems that hydrogen has a much better use case for for aviation than for cars. So I'm going to post this article. I'm going to post a link to this article on the on the show notes. Yeah, please do because that's that yeah. definitely summarizes our position. That's exactly yes. how we. 
Uh, and, and for those in the audience that are not familiar with how hydrogen works, can you explain briefly why, why hydrogen is better and how this system works? Because in, as you explained, in, you are aiming for a system which actually what it does is you will be able to explain it better. But basically, either you use it directly, like creating thrust by burning it, or you use this hydrogen to run an, an, elect, an electric engine. So. Yeah. Can you explain now for the audience that there might be, I'm sure there's many people that are familiar with this topic, but many others that are not that familiar with this hydrogen technology. Can you explain briefly how this works? Yeah, definitely. And I can also just, I think it's worth sort of framing all of this by saying that in our solution, we are only as green as the hydrogen is green that we use. So for that reason, the, the, the emphasis on green renewably produced hydrogen in our solution is, is very important. Um, and I think that that's also, you know, people often ask sort of why now, like why hasn't, you know, hydrogen has been around for ages, like what's actually changed, like why is now a, good, a better time? And I think the developments on uh, the electrolysis side of things are an important factor in that conversation in that I think the world at large has realized that hydrogen is going to be a bigger part of our energy transition story in aviation, but in a lot of other sectors. And therefore, compared to, for example, where we were five years ago, today, the cost of green hydrogen production has fallen significantly. And a lot of countries have adopted policies um, on kind of rolling that out at scale. Yeah, um, so the availability, sorry? Well, just one question here about the hydrogen production. As far as I know, I'm not an expert in the topic, but hydrogen is one of the most abundant elements in, in nature. The difficulty is in getting it in a, in a, form, the... in a, in a form that can yeah. be used, right? Because it, it happens right. naturally, but you need to... What, what is the difficulty for getting it in a, in a form that uh, you can actually so use? Hydrogen for... is one of the lightest molecules. So, 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 so first of all, is kind of where it's abundant, but you need it in a concentrated form, right? So we, so I guess maybe to talk through kind of the steps of our solution, what we're, what our vision is, is to have hydrogen that is made on site at the airport using renewable electricity through solar wind and water. So those two together uh, through the process of electrolysis produce hydrogen and the hydrogen molecule when it's produced in that way is completely green and, and kind of you know, zero emission and it's sort of local. So then we basically have a hydrogen stream coming out of it and the next challenge is then to compress that and store it in some adequate way so that we can bring a lot of it on the aircraft. Mm -hmm. um, and so the degree to which you compress the hydrogen is what affects you know, how much of it fits in a certain you know, size of the container um, and therefore how much it weighs and things like that. So that's kind of the, so the first piece is how do you make the hydrogen and how much does that cost? Second piece is how do you store it? And you can store it in gas form or liquid form. So long term, we want to move to liquid form, but that's, that takes quite a lot of energy to kind of recompress it back and you need to store it at a very low temperature as well. Yeah, it's something like minus 200 and something degrees, right? Yeah, so there's a kind of cryogenic storage solutions that are, that are being developed, but at the mm -hmm. moment they're not like fully you know, economically viable. Um, so we at Zeravia are working with, a, with hydrogen in a compressed gas form at 350 bar of pressure, which is not very high kind of, you know, in, in the range of possibility. Uh, once we start commercial operation in the two, in the 20 seat system, we'll probably move to 700 bar compressed gas. But then long term, when we start talking about jets and cross Atlantic travel and kind of meaningful, you know, passenger loads and things like that, we do need to move to liquid uh, from, because of the volumetric constraints. Uh, mm -hmm. It would just, you know, we, you, you, you could physically lift it, but there would just be too much volume for the aircraft to actually have the aerodynamic qualities that it needs to be able to move. Yeah, um, actually, um, I just want to add here that I'm going to post a link to these articles written by, by this engineer that I, I interviewed, Bjorn Ferm, because he's got a very interesting renderings of what a transatlantic aircraft might look like if it had to okay. carry all this hydrogen. Obviously, there are some compromises there. So there are some trade-offs yeah. and yeah. might might affect the way that airplanes are designed. But that that's right. we're talking for big airplanes that need to carry lots of people like planes yeah. carry now. But and Airbus as well. We we've seen that they come up with some designs as well. Uh, yeah. Some are more yeah. conventional. Some others are more. Yeah. Uh, like yeah, but I guess the, the parameters that you're working with, right, is is sort of the volume, the weight. And then where in the aircraft this can go. And so one of the, because the final kind of sort of part that I wanted to explain was, you know, as you asked, which, between combustion and, and fuel cell based. So in our solution, 
So we make the hydrogen on site using electrolysis. We then put it into a, a canister, a tank uh, that is compressed at 350 bar, which you know, takes some energy. And the tank itself has some weight and some cost associated with it. And that forms um, part of our system. So the tank gets mounted on, on the aircraft, refilled. Um, and then we have a fuel cell system on the aircraft, which takes the hydrogen in its kind of gaseous form, puts it through the fuel cell, and that produces electricity, which then powers the electric motor. So our system is, some people don't fully re recognize this, but our system is electric. So some, some people think electric has to be battery, but it, that's not the case. So in our case, it's hydrogen electric, which means the hydrogen is kind of our, our battery, if you want to think about it in, in simple terms. And then the only um, sort of output of that is what well, electricity and then uh, vapor that dissipates in the air. Um, so so it's, there's no emission kind of in its in use when it's in, in, in the plane. Um, and indeed, as you were saying, kind of, you know, if for the size aircraft we're flying now, uh, that configuration works fine. And the technology we have available today for storage and everything like that is sufficient. Um, but if you were to think about flying, you know, a 300 person jet with, uh, with uh, you know luggage and all of that, the that exact configuration wouldn't work. You would need to move to uh, probably liquid. Um, I mean, you also would not be flying turboprop aircraft. It would be a different propulsion system altogether. Um, and then um, you know you, you would need to basically play around with the different variables such as you know weight, volume, and therefore sort of payload and range, um, and to see what combination is feasible. Um, but one thing that's worth mentioning and it's a big part of the reason that we are proponents of an electric system, even for the larger aircraft, is that um, a combustion system, you know, the combustion engine has been around for a long time um, and people have been innovating for, you know, we've, they've, we have made them a lot better than they used to be. But we think the kind of incremental improvements in that technology that are still available to us are very, very limited. So the kind of fuel efficiency and therefore aircraft efficiency. Are limited whereas an electric system is by it, it is a lot more efficient sort of in flight it also ha is much simpler uh to operate because there's there's no combustion there's no heat there's no you know there's no not, not as many component kind of fr fr friction going on so the system is simpler it has lower maintenance requirements and it is more efficient in flight um, but but the other big benefit of it is that you can move away from a centralized combustion system because it, with a jet engine it, you need to have the fuel located centrally to feed uh, the the combustion engine. But with an electric system, over time, we're going to be moving to a distributed propulsion system because we can basically have rather than having one huge thing in the middle, we can have a motor and a fuel cell system replicated eight times sort of throughout the aircraft. So we can actually decentralize. The mm -hmm. propulsion system and that can offer quite interesting advantages from a design perspective and can actually free up room for fuel storage and things like that yeah actually the distributed propulsion is quite quite an interesting thing i'm gonna again post some links so that people can can check them out i i had the chance to write an article for cnn about electric planes and i i could see those designs i was a nasa one i think with a I don't know how many, like more than a dozen propellers distributed all over the wing. There are no efficiency losses then from having all these different engines all over the place. Because in, in jet engines, I mean, they tend to be get bigger and bigger because I guess there are efficiency gains from, from having these super huge engines. But I guess that the, the dynamics that, that apply here are a bit different. Yeah, yeah. Because I think, I think when you're moving to a, a motor that that is operating in in, in that way, uh, so mm -hmm. I think you can, you can kind of cumulatively combine propulsion from a number of different sources in a way that you cannot with mm -hmm. combustion. And what about all the infrastructure? Because well, one of the obstacles that I can see here is actually the whole way that the system now it's it's designed. There's a huge infrastructure of not just the planes but all the all the support systems behind them, the factories, all the maintenance. And for hydrogen, you mentioned you were planning to produce that on site, but what about yeah. the logistics involved? I guess it's not that easy when you have to scale this up to a global level and, and you have all the old legacy infrastructure that are, it's prepared to handle fuel. Uh, yeah. And then you need to, to handle a different type of material and have, yeah, all this transformation. I guess it might take yeah. some time to get yeah. it Yeah, I mean, you know, we will pretend that, uh, that there for sure there are changes that need to happen, right? So mm -hmm. for this technology to be adopted at scale at every airport, there needs to be 
infrastructure investment that takes place. And it's, you know, it's a bit of a chicken or egg because quite often we speak to like the larger oil and gas players or kind of larger gas players. So a lot, a lot of them now have a green hydrogen business unit, you yeah. know, and we'll speak to them and say like, oh, you know, do you want to do something together for aviation? They say, absolutely. You know, we're looking for as many use cases as we can find. But you know, for us, it's only interesting above a certain daily tonnage. Yeah. Um, so because I think I, the, the production of hydrogen can be a very profitable business, but they obviously they need the offtake. So yep. I think the way that's probably going to work, you know, as similar to other innovation in any other area, is that we'll start small and start with like, you know, two airport city pairs. We'll probably at least partially own the infrastructure in those early days ourselves so that we can actually mm-hmm. fully demonstrate how all this whole thing works together. And then over time, uh, like we don't want to be a, a hydrogen production company. Mm-hmm. Uh, we still we want to be a powertrain company, but um it will take us a bit of time, I think, to demonstrate to the world how all the pieces fit together. So probably in the early commercial introduction days, we will take greater ownership for that whole piece mm-hmm. and kind of provide everything kind of as a one-stop service. Um, and then and then ex- effectively work together with you know Shell, who already is the biggest provider of aviation fuel and you know, players like that, to roll out green hydrogen infrastructure at scale. But yeah. the way that we're doing it now, so in Cranfield, you know, in our small setup now, we own all of it. We have a small electrolysis kind of modular unit. And we also purchased a refueling truck uh, okay. that sort of gets the hydrogen from the from the electrolysis box, and then sort of it's mobile, so that that drives to the aircraft in the same way that you refuel kind of jet fuel today. Uh, it's, a, it's a refueling kind of mobile system, so yeah. it's not fundamentally different. But of course, there are some you know technical challenges to overcome for how to fill it with co- compressed gas and then over time liquid. So for sure, there's work that needs to be done. But um, you know, I think we are putting a big emphasis on demonstrating all of that together in the early days so that it's it doesn't seem quite as mysterious perhaps as it, as it might otherwise be so mm-hmm. yeah. yeah and i i guess we we can expect a, an, an ecosystem as well to to develop new technology, technologies here i remember having read about this guy that used to be at airbus innovation paul eremenko i think he also launched a, a venture which yeah. i think tried to solve this logistics issue i think they, yeah, they had so they this focus on the fueling side yeah yeah this system of um quite interesting of capsules that kind of modules that you can move around and, and just insert in the aircraft, uh, retrofitted aircraft, and, and then simplify all this fueling process. So I found it quite, quite interesting. I guess there is there's a sort of a gray area where the existing technology is kind of getting to its limit, but the other technology is not yet fully developed. Have you calculated when could this tipping point be? Are we talking about a decade, two decades? Some of the airframes that are now flying, they have been designed many decades past. Yeah. I guess at some point the OEMs will have also this dilemma. I mean, are we continue yeah. stretching this technology or, or we yeah. go for something completely new? And we have seen Airbus having these concepts, but they are con- concepts so far and we know it takes some time. Yeah, for, no, it will take some time, yeah. yeah. No, I, mean, I think this is one of the challenges with this industry, right? Is that an airframe is in operation for up to 30 years. So actually, you know, if anybody purchases an Airbus this year, they're kind mm-hmm. of stuck with it. And while at Zeravia, we can do the retrofit approach with the smaller airframes, that's not going to work for larger planes. And that's why I think, you know, we're, we're working bottom up on it, but we're really trying to push the industry to, to, to make this transition as soon as possible because of the lock-in effect of the existing technologies. So, so I think there's a, a bit of a difference between when is this technically feasible uh, from when it's going to be actually practically possible, given the c- economic constraints of all the players involved, both you know the operators, all the financing companies that own all this infrastructure, as well as, as you alluded to, kind of the, the charging infrastructure itself. I mean, we think in the kind of smaller regional segment, this can be absolutely a reality kind of within the next decade. So I think once our solution is rolled out in early 2023, sorry, late 23, 24, um, you know, it, it can really accelerate from that point. But for the larger jets, you know, it, it will take because there, there is a bit more of a technical challenge to overcome, and then there will be a greater lock-in effect because you know they're more expensive jets, and there's more of them, and the kind of the footprint of of of, of those industry of of that existing sort of fleet is is much greater. Um, but you know, but we think that announcements indeed by players like Airbus, the fact that they're working on this alone is moving us in the right direction, uh, and I think it's also pressure from the operators themselves has also been really helpful from everything that we've seen, you know, like airlines making net zero commitments, governments Mm -hmm. making kind of specific commitments for aviation, passengers really, 
you know, requiring this almost, I think is going to move the it's going to, I think it's going to accelerate. Like when exactly the tipping point, I mean, probably for the industry at scale, it's probably a decade away, I would say, but for the smaller aircraft, I think it's sooner. Uh, because I know already if you're, say, a business traveler and you're open to kind of business jet, smaller aircraft type of model, a lot of the time it can actually be cheaper and greener to fly in an alternative propulsion system. So I think we, we really see it kicking off. And, you know, and potentially, actually, if we can make the smaller aircraft cheap and green to operate, then we might actually see the industry shift towards those kinds of aircraft and actually those starting to take share from the larger jets because mm -hmm. like for example when i fly from london to paris there's really no reason that i should be flying an airbus other than currently it's more efficient <laughs> than yeah. you know a smaller aircraft but if you change that comparison uh then it might actually change the way that airlines sort of meet passenger demand altogether so mm -hmm. yeah and, and and well let's not forget that there there are thousands and thousands of uh, small aircraft out there so we tend to yeah. think of course in the focus on the big planes but yeah it's the number of small planes general aviation private jets yeah uh, everything yeah and the small huge. aircraft are, are less efficient because yeah. they, you know, we haven't invested as much in making them efficient so mm -hmm. and they actually they do account for a larger share of emissions disproportionately because they spend more of their time either taking off or landing because of the shorter mm -hmm. missions it, they fly is it going to be cheaper to operate that's a big, big part of our, our our model. Yes, we absolutely we think for it to be adopted at scale, it needs to be cheaper, and we think it absolutely can be. And the the cost savings are driven by two main factors. One is um, the difference in fuel price. Uh, so if you look at a um, kind of twenty twenty three projection, green hydrogen is expected to come down to something in the order of three dollars per kilo. Um, meanwhile, jet fuel for a small regional operator. Is actually not that cheap so the kind of you know dollar per gallon price that we sort of think of that's not actually what a small airline pays at a small regional airport they pay more in the order of three to four dollars per gallon mm -hmm. and once you sort of compare those two numbers together you see that hydrogen all in kind of on a per mile flown basis is cheaper so that's kind of one big driver and then the second big driver is um, the maintenance cost improvements because of it, it's an electric system, it has much longer intervals between so what's called the like time between overhaul. So how many hours you can fly before you need to sort of fully maintain the system. And for an electric system like ours, we think that that interval is much longer and the mm -hmm. overhaul itself is cheaper. Is it because a smaller amount of moving parts? Or, yes. Yeah. yeah, and no temperature, no, no friction. So the system has very different performance characteristics. I mean, the same way as it is the case with cars. Mm -hmm. If you look at, you know, electric yeah. sort of, motor just doesn't it doesn't really break so yeah yeah actually i was amazed when i was talking with these um uh, german guys that did uh, the all electric flight they gave me some numbers of the basically the cost or the, the equivalent in uh, of the energy they had uh, they had spent and uh, it was truly amazing i mean i think they it it was the just uh, the energy, the energy spent was the equivalent of, uh, I think, 20 liters, something like that, of, yeah. of fuel for, for, a, for a flight that basically did 800, 800 miles, I think, something like yeah. that. Really yeah. impressive. Very good. So it, it sounds very, very promising. I'm sure, I'm very sure that we are going to be hearing from, from you guys soon as you go on with all yes. this program of testing and, and developing yeah. new, new projects. So it would be great to um keep in touch and uh yeah definitely uh, yeah definitely follow us and keep in touch and over the mm -hmm. next couple of months we'll have lots of big announcements to come yeah. so for people that are interested in learning more about zero avia and your project what's the best way to uh to follow you guys on uh, your website zero avia yeah our com. website is a good place and we you know we, through that we have links to our social media presence as well and also on youtube we actually have a number of um, one you can see our flight videos but you can also see a number of like pitches and other talks by our founder Val Miftikov that that give a very good overview of some of the things that we've touched on already but um mm -hmm. kind of go into a bit more detail so yes we've got a pretty good media presence all, overall so very yeah. good uh, i'm going to make sure that we get those links and resources in the show notes so that everyone Great. that is uh, interested can can keep an eye on on your progress and uh, yeah hopefully can speak soon with more news and developments and milestones being achieved in this very interesting quest to disrupt Absolutely. aviation with greener yeah. energy. It's been a pleasure, Katya. Uh, thank you so much. And, uh, thank you much for having us and for, you know, for all the insightful questions. And yeah, it would be great to stay in touch. All the best with the project.
Perfect. Thank you. Thanks, Mikhail. Bye. And one more thing before you go. Remember, you can subscribe to the Oplane podcast on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, on Google Podcasts, Stitcher, and many other platforms. If you like this podcast, please do not hesitate to give it a good rating or to recommend it to a friend. See you soon. Bye.